So there's going to be another packet uh, which I've put together, which is um, Susan Kraft kindly typed out this thing about the history of Tibetan Buddhism. And it was written by somebody in India. And um, I was asked to fix up the translation or to translate it or I forget what way back. And I don't know, wrote it. Uh, I was in my files, and <laughs> I think it came out in a uh, in an art book. And I was promised a copy of the art book, which was very fancy, from Japan. And of course, it was never sent to me. And I wrote and asked for it, and it was like, "Who the hell do you think you are?" <laughs> so maybe I should just publish this in the you know. No, this is it. Just gives you an idea of how a Tibetan would write a history of the four orders of Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, and undoubtedly was a Gilupa, so, uh, you know, how good he is on other sects, I forget. Um, and it came, it starts very nicely with how humans came to be in Tibet. And there's this short uh, four-page section Somewhat difficult to read, but you're used to that by now. From Tsongkhapa's great exposition of the uh, stages of mantra on whether it's possible to achieve a non-conceptual state from a conceptual state. Uh, that I hastily put together a couple years ago when uh, David Trumano had that conference. Just couldn't sleep at night, so I got up and, that, and then didn't mention it. Then there's a long four-page bibliography in very small type that I believe um, David, there are too many Davids around, David Need put together several years ago. And uh, that'll be in the back of it. And it just gives you something which certainly isn't complete, but lists more works than are on reserve over the library. The first category is Tantra Bibliography on Reserve. And these were ones that probably are still on reserve under uh, this course. So you ought to visit the library and find out what's on reserve and start to handle the books. You know, just flip through them. Ah, oh, would you give me this one? Oh, give it back. We used to have a bibliography pro seminar at the University of Wisconsin. That's pretty much what she did. Now the books were gathered in a room and you go in with the handle. You kind of, you know, you look through the table of contents and flip through it. You have some idea of what it was. That's in the bookstore? Now this is going to be in the bookstore. I'll hand it in today. I forget. Paper. And before that, with regard to, let me just give you a few Tibetan words for the Tibetanists, uh, finishing up this topic of the action time for meditation. Uh, and if you would please add these to your own charts. You don't have to add them to the ones you hand in to me today. But learn this. Do a thing a thing. So then what's the next one? No one can beat me to it. Some good thing is in, right? Two good things in. Who some two good things in song? Say it. Who some two good things in song? Who some two good things in song? Song. Who some two good things in song? Then they drew down Jebet Sam Sam then.
for the non-Tibetanists, this is meditative stabilization of the exalted body, speech, and mind. Thank you. They do the JV Samden. Say it. They do the JV Samden. Say it. They do 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 it. They means to repeat. Okay? So they do means repetition. Alex Wayman mistranslated as mutter. All right? Because that's one of the types of repetition. The Sanskrit word. Uh, actually doesn't mean mutter any more than the Tibetan does. It's japa. And japa doesn't any more mean mutter than danger. Tang jebe sanden. Concentration together with repetition. And deju la madube sanden. So now, I'll just make a comment that, um, you know, like this word gu, um, most non, most European, Americans and Europeans, you know, treat this, oh, <laughs> As ku, something like that, and the the, the pronunciation uh, is, I say, more like ku, hi, g. Now the fault with this system, but the advantage of this system is that you do get a higher tone, ku, 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 ku. You know, in English, just what we would automatically come out with. Fall with this system is even though you get the G is more appropriate, we lower the G automatically, and you start forgetting that you're that you're supposed you forget this line just because you fall into the automatic associations of your original language, and so of course you know it has to be something like written this way or you know you have to make up new letters. And of course, you could just leave it. <laughs> but you, the problem is, you end up associating uh, uh, these sounds with certain sounds that we learned early on. And so, Arab people saying all sorts of weird things in Europe and America. And then, of course, Tibetans come over here and say, My name is Kelsang. <laughs> Kel Sang for Gesang, right? So it's with, this is a system that I inaugurated from teaching. You know, I kept having to say, well, we spell it K-U, but it's really G-U. Hi. And then students say, well, why don't you write it that way? And I say, well, you know, we don't write it that way. And then, and then decided to write it. And this was a shock to many people, but I noticed that uh, Melvin Goldstein ex has the same, similar sort of explanation now. He doesn't use it in his general system, but then he explains it's more like this than it is in And the same in the third column, you know, it's a cough. <coughs> it has no suffix or head. But the associations that you bring to it uh, screw up how you pronounce it, no matter which way you do it. So. Is that the same with the pa and the bum? Because I noticed you're yeah. one of the only few that spelled some the pa with the P-A. -E right. It -E really pisses off some people. Even the, the <laughs> thong, you see? Right. Thong pa. And actually, because this is the last syllable, it, it, it's, it's not the first syllable. It tends to lower anyway. Even a word like nyinter, nyinter, comes out as nyinter, nyinter. Now, I don't know what that dir is, but it's not nyinter. Changes happen in the second syllable, second, third syllable. 
Tsongkha. So it's very hard for me, even, now that I've formulated this system, to not lower it and say Tsongkha. Entirely wrong. Tsongkha. Tsongkha. And you have to get used to saying these without feeling weird. You know? Tsongkha. Tsong. And you just say Tsong, 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 you know, until you get sick of it. Tsong, 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 Tsong. You know, it's like the da 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 in Sanskrit. You just say it enough until it's not strange. Well, you're not going, duh! <laughs> <laughs> My favorite is a friend of mine who tries very hard to pronounce plasa, which is really HL when you think about it. It's like the word where in English, which is HW. Where, you know, even though we don't know it. Plasa is HL, so he says Lhasa. <laughs> <laughs> now you could say Lhasa and drop the H. Don't put some two ends to that, Lhasa. But not Lhasa. <laughs> I love it. He's, uh, dis he is uh, dis dyslexic, so uh, I, don't try to, I don't try to correct him. Because <laughs> it would just end up. <laughs> He gave me directions once on how to get to his place. <laughs> <laughs> so, Gu Song took it things in. Song, Deju, and Jebe Sand, and Tang, Deju, and Madurbe Sand. Then, on Deju, and Madurbe Sand, there are three items. And that's it. That's all I want you to know. But you should know this. You know, it'd be weird to know this much about action tantra and not know the. You know this, right? Mene. Mene is something. Mel and never. That's what it means. Mene is something. Do you all know what these mean? Are there any questions about the meaning? Don't. Don't feel embarrassed to ask, uh, like, okay. like what's Samden or something like that. What? I'm asking. What? What is Samden? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. But Wh which? Could you give the definition? I mean, the translation of the second one again. I didn't catch which that. Which part? Pager? The whole thing. Lots of things that without. Uh, not relying. Uh, uh, concentration, not relying on Samden. Yeah. I mean, on Pager. Repetition. repetition. Concentration, concentration having or together with repetition. Good. I mean, please don't. Uh, we'll just laugh at your uproarious little that's all. May take some then. No, it's very bad when, um, you know, people hold back from asking uh, very elementary questions. So, concentration of abiding in fire, because this is short for me la ne, which is abide, and me la ne be right? Kalma ne be sanden, ne be. You see, this is high. Ne. Nebe. Down nebe sande. Down nebe sande. Down va. Down va. Kaba deva sande. Bestowing liberation at the end of sin. Concentration, bestowing liberation at the end of sin. That's all. Any questions? Gu sun tu. Gu sun tu.
that's the thing. The paper. The course has essentially three topics. This section on action tantra that we've finished. Now a section on the difference between sutra and tantra. And then finally a section on the difference between the four tantras. Four tantra sets, yes. I have a question about the chart that we are doing for today. I was yes. wondering where the feet fit into the chart. It seemed, I mean, do they occur along the ten grounds or? Are there specific places where they fit in all the time? The three yoga books seem to keep them separate. Yes, um, it's upon developing the concentration bestowing liberation at the end of sound, isn't it? that one is capable of achieving these feats. Some of them one can achieve prior to that. Um, does that answer your question? No. Uh, five paths and 10 grams. So. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, if it's upon completion of the concentration bestowing liberation at the end of sound, since that marks the beginning of the path of preparation, it would be during the path of preparation and, and thereafter that the feats would mainly be achieved. Does that make sense? Well, Any contradiction? Hoffman says for the concentration of stirring liberation at the end of sound to accomplish the task of removing the obstructions to omniscience, mm -hmm. it must be enhanced in force, this being accomplished not only through the usual great vehicle means of activities of compassion, but also through the particularly tantric means of utilizing special feats in order to promote others' welfare. Are those feats we're talking about? Well, and what does it explain as the meaning of bestowing feats there? Um, the, it qualifies um, it. Yeah. Um, so that, um, um, beginning of chapter six, concentration about repetition, right after the repetition. Um, <coughs> From among the three principles, the first, the secret mantra of abiding fire, or concentration of abiding fire, is said to bestow feats, not in the sense that it alone is sufficient for the achievement of major yogic feats, but in the sense that through causing the concentration on mantra to become more powerful and causing the mind to become more stable, one comes closer to the achievement of feats. Yes, so you see it's explaining away this statement that it bestows feats. Right. It's saying it really doesn't bestow feats. This comes with the uh, concentration bestowing liberation at the end of sound, which marks the beginning of the path of preparation. And that concentration goes all the way on up to Buddhahood, right? So it has to, it, it, it has to overcome the artificial afflictive obstructions at the path of seeing. Or it in my, the path of seeing, one version of it is the path of seeing that overcomes the artificial obstruct, afflictive obstructions that prevent liberation from sickly existence. Then going on in the path of meditation, or it is the path of meditation that overcomes the innate afflictive obstructions. And then from the eighth ground up, it is the eighth ground and up that overcome the obstructions to omniscience. So what changes the concentration of bestowing liberation at the end of sound from how it is at the beginning of the path of preparation to how it is at the beginning of the path of seeing to how it is at the beginning of the path of meditation to how it is at the beginning of the eighth bodhisattva ground? <clears throat> Uh, 
At the beginning of the path of preparation, the concentration bestowing liberation at the end of sound has uh, a sense of duality with it between subject and object, between the emptiness that is being realized and the wisdom consciousness that's realizing it. And gradually, over four phases of the path of preparation, that sense of duality diminishes and disappears, at which point you have direct cognition of emptiness. With that direct cognition of emptiness, in one instant, all artificial uh, afflictive obstructions are removed, like from studying at the University of Virginia, high school, you know, you name it, college, but not at the monastery. <laughs> Uh, now, that consciousness becomes, or through re-entering direct cognition of emptiness again and again, it doesn't say how, but just through doing that again and again, the con that wisdom consciousness, meaning that concentration bestowing liberation at the, end of the of the end of sound, becomes strong enough, powerful enough to overcome the great of the great uh, innate afflictive obstructions. Then, over from the, from the second, really, to the beginning of the eighth bodhisattva ground, all of the innate afflictive obstructions are overcome. Now, what empowers that very same wisdom consciousness, that very same concentration bestowing liberation at the end of sound, that is non-dualistically realizing emptiness, to overcome also the obstructions to omniscience. Well, as in the perfection vehicle, it is the practice of the bodhisattva motivation, uh, love, compassion, the altruistic nature to achieve enlightenment, and the deeds that are induced by it, and the particularly tantric version of this being the yoga. Right? In addition, one thing that juices up the consciousness is, you know, okay, so this is, these are meritorious, the, the love, compassion, the altruistic aspiration to enlightenment are other directed minds and activities. So one tantric way of accumulating more merit from these activities is to engage in special feats in order to help others to remove contagion from the area, to remove flu from Charlottesville, yeah, really. To, to ward off the communist Chinese invasion of Tibet. You know, can't you see all the people out there <laughs> trying to do this? They were, you know, speaking pejoratively, but I mean, it is what people try to do. So through using these special feats, like, uh, developing alertness of mind so that you can understand a text immediately upon reading it. And if this is used for the benefit of others, if that's one's motivation, then you have, you have some special activity that you're using to help others, and thus you're accumulating more merit. That it was your question, and that that explains the statement, but you didn't, you didn't quote the statement, did you? And it wasn't the statement that Leslie read. Did somebody else read? You read. Would you read it again? Yes. For the concentration bestowing liberation at the end of sound to accomplish the task of removing the obstructions to omniscience, it must be enhanced in force, this being accomplished not only through the usual great vehicle means of activities of compassion, but also through the particularly tantric means of utilizing special feats in order to promote others' welfare. Is that clear? Uh, that's the last bit of concentration. 97, the last paragraph. 97. Well, not actually the last paragraph, but one before right. more to come. <coughs> yes. I have a question. You said that uh, when you finally directly perceive happiness and artificially acquired afflictive obstructions, yes. And then yet to get rid of the name of the victim, 
constructions, it takes like this kind of a process and kind of a consequent thing. Why is in fact why is there a difference? Like why why is there a difference? Yeah, why don't you like yes. kind of wash out also your own yes. official yes. um, constructions rather than just like all of a sudden just come. It's said to be like um, well, in analogy is used, like washing clothes, that immediately the worst dirt is washed out, but the deeper dirt is, is harder to get out, that the innate is more embedded in our mental continuums and thus is harder to get rid of. Now, one of the distinctive features of highest yoga tantra, the fourth class, is that one moment of the path of seeing destroys both the artificial and innate afflictive obstructions. One moment does both. Why? Because the consciousness directly realizing emptiness is on a much subtler level. It must be very subtle in the first place. In, a, in action tantra, if you're not dualistically realizing emptiness, without the five types of dualism that we've talked about here, OK? I mean, relative to our type of consciousness, even a mind of calm abiding, we would consider that, you know, we'd probably, if we happened to stumble into it for a few moments, we'd think that this was liberation. No question. Never mind a mind of special insight realizing emptiness. Never mind a mind directly realizing emptiness. But in, in any case, in highest yoga tantra, it's posited that there's a series of eight levels of consciousness beneath even this level of meditative equipoise directly realizing emptiness. We pass through them when we're going to sleep. We pass through them when we sneeze. We pass through them when we end a dream. We pass through them. Uh, in orgasm, how we pass through them when we faint. And so what they're seeking to do is to utilize this most subtle consciousness to realize the emptiness of inherent existence. And so the extra power of highest yoga tantra comes from utilizing that level of mind. So powerful that not only are the artificial obstructions to omniscience removed when you get to that level, but the uh, innate ones are overcome also. So you, you do the equivalent of jumping immediately to the beginning of the eighth bodhisattva grand, from the first bodhisattva grand to the eighth bodhisattva grand. You just jump. And some people say, even to talk about the 10 grounds at this point is irrelevant. You know. You're superimposing a, super, a sutra system on a tantra system that doesn't work in this gradual way. However, it is very helpful in that it shows you what is accomplished by this initial moment of, uh, the, of the fundamental innate mind of clear light's realization of emptiness. Now, I've been talking about one moment. That doesn't mean that this state lasts one moment. It just means that in the first moment, they're all overcome. Yes? Now in the action tantra, when you're entering, re-entering this path of seeing over and over and over again and slowly eliminating the subtle yes. and subtler innate uh, afflictive emotions, is it because each time you're re-entering it or recognizing emptiness, is it more profound each time? Or is it longer each time? Or is it, why is it? It's. Uh, these topics are very, very interesting. It's like um, they're all supposed to be similar. Every meditative equipoise directly realizing emptiness from the beginning to the end is supposed to be similar. Yet, each of them uh, overcomes a, you know, a progressively a worse level of the afflictive emotions and then of the, finally, of the obstructions to omniscience. Also, with each of the bodhisattva grounds, that meditative equipoise, it's called the ground because it serves to generate greater qualities. Just as the earth grows, 
various kinds of plants. Uh, the, the system itself is very clear that bumi means ground. It doesn't mean stage. You know, you know in one sense it is stage, but it's ground. Uh, nobody says. Nobody says. You don't more thoroughly understand it. You don't more non-dualistically understand it. So I guess all of the innate qualities are kind of like the stages of muck built up on us, and each time we enter the path, it's like it removes. It sounds like it just removes another level. Same yeah. detergent, same cycle. Yes. And, but it's just but it may be that you have to put it through the same cycle for quite a long time before you can get to the next level of dirt. So it is longer than or is it just? Uh, not, well, longer, I thought you meant by when you enter it, you could stay in the state longer. No, it doesn't mean that. But in order to move to the next phase, you may have to enter, re-enter, OK? Now, it's said in the sutra system that in order to attain Buddhahood, you have to practice for three periods of countless seance, countless great aeons. <laughs> yes, I was just trying to uh, wrap my mind around around it. That's half a joke. <clears throat> What's a great A? Eighty intermediate aims. Oh, eighty intermediate A. Right. <laughs> wow. <Shut up>. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So the first 20 are? <laughs> Depends. Some people start at formation, formation or vacuity. You could put vacuity <laughs> at the beginning or the end. I usually put it at the end. I think some people do put it at the beginning. So you have 20 aeons, intermediate aeons, where there's nothing, you know, it's vacuity. And uh, 20 intermediate aeons, which the world system is forming. Then you have 20 intermediate aeons when the world system is abiding. We are in the, uh, and so you see, the first is like that. And this is lifespan, the dip. It starts out very long, uh, so-called immeasurable, and goes down to 10 years. The average lifespan in our world system at some point will be 10 years. Uh, right now, well, when Chakyamuni lived, it was 100 years. Some people say it's around 80 years now. I don't know. <laughs> uh, you know, it's when they're in the United States and it looks over like 80. But anyway, uh, it, that, that Shakyamuni was born at around 100 is clear from the text, okay? System. Which, which means that the world was better off then than it is now. This is a system which our world is getting worse off. And it's, um, there's a period of uh, Tsungel. Uh, aeon of weapons that we're in. Uh, and the ruinations and so forth of character and so forth getting worse and worse and worse. We'll go down to 10 years and then it'll start moving up. So you see each one of these uh, bell curves is one intermediate aeon. And so you get 18 of those and the first one is a half bell curve and the last one is a half bell curve. And then there will be, uh, and so all of this is occurring here. And so we're right here. So our world system has a while to go. And each peak has a Buddha? So oh, um, Maitreya comes. And your Manakaya. Um, yeah, an, an openly appearing emanation body. Maitreya, I think, comes when it's 100 years again. Now, I don't know about the Actually, each, each statement. Because uh, in one of the texts in the Pali Canada talks about how 
it's going to go all the way down, then it's going to go all the way up, and when it starts going down again, my train is going to go. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm. Well, I thought it was this. Uh, and then 20, 40, 60, and then 20 aeons of destruction. 20 intermediate aeons. And so a great aeon is uh, 80 of the 80 intermediate aeons. And a period of countless great aeons. Is one with 50 months here? One, I've been told anyway, one with 59 zeros. So I, I, don't, I don't know how you write that. One times 10 to the 59. Really? Mm -hmm. You would think it was probably 60, though, that this was his interpretation yeah. of these, OK? So countless is a specific number. <laughs> and then in the sutra system, it takes three of these to achieve Buddha. Sutra Mahayam, according to these Gilupa sources. How much is one aeon as far as years? Can we get this down into years? <laughs> or does it not work? No, I don't, I don't think I have years. But you would think you could go backwards, though. Yeah, like how, many, how many years? These are intermediate aeons. aeons. You should look in, uh, in Vasubandhu, Obidama Kosha. Does this have anything to do with Kalpa? Or yes. Kalpa is yes. an aeon. Yes, aeon. Right. Now, in the Great Vehicle Sutra system, it takes three periods. So. What's happening here in Action Tantra is that the first period, the first of the three, is done faster. This is to get you to the point of well, at least the uh, beginning of the path of preparation. That's done much faster through Action Tantra than it is through the Sutras. And then the rest of the path, according to Tsongkhapa, is done in the way that the sutra system proceeds. Even after having generated the uh, concentration bestowing liberation at the end of sound, you have to spend two periods of countless seans in a continual practice in order to attain Buddhahood. Yes? I didn't hear where you made the break off. The break off is at the a beginning of the path of preparation. It may be at the beginning of the path of seeing. That was my hesitation. The first period of countless hands. I forget. Look in Jules Levinson. But in any case, as far as action tantra is concerned, where you get the enhancement in speed is to get to the beginning of the path of preparation. And then you see from there on, there isn't much description. Why? Because you've got to keep on doing this. That's Tsongkhapa's claim. Pudun's claim is that there's, there's enlightenment in this lifetime in any of the tantras, in any of the four tantras. Tsongkhapa says no. Why? Because in order to achieve enlightenment in one lifetime, you need the practice of highest yoga tantra. Why? Because you need that fundamental innate mind of clear life. You see, this deeper level of consciousness. He's got a reason. You need that deeper level of consciousness realizing emptiness. So, Jeffrey, in Highest Yoga Tantra, then, if you overcome all the innate and acquired afflictive obstructions in the first moment of the path of seeing, is the path of preparation only overcoming uh, the obstructions to our missions? Say it again. Whoa. <laughs> If a, what? That's a crazy question. If the, <laughs> if the first, in highest yoga, yoga tantra, if the first moment of the path of seeing overcomes all the uh, acquired and innate afflictive obstructions, mm -hmm. then the path of preparation would... You're going backwards, right? I beg your pardon. Path of meditation. Path of meditation. Mm -hmm. 
then overcomes the obstructions to, to omniscience. omniscience. Right. Yes. I forget quite how we started this discussion. We were wondering about the feats and where the feats occur. Um, what, was, what was quick about the mantra system? It doesn't take three countless eons. Right. Is that how it started? Is that how it's, yeah. So could I ask you that? I understood that hmm. the, the mantra gets you through the path of accumulation quickly. So, so you don't. So that, that's the first part. But then what did you say about the path of Prasambhava, about the path of preparation? That it, does it proceed along similar lines in action tantra to the sutra path? Yes. At the same speed? Yes. And it's only in highest yoga tantra for him that you go through that quickly. Yes. That you go, that you can achieve enlightenment in one life, or even a few life. And Buddha, Buddha thinks otherwise. Yeah, I mean, he's, he argues the, the opposite case. But Tsongkhapa has good reason for it. You follow, it's not, it's not like this tradition or that tradition. He's again, he's focused on, well, the fundamental name, mind of clear light in highest yoga tantra is a whole different level of consciousness. And it does something special. So if you're going to maintain that tenet, that it does something special, then you're going to have to uh, review how you look at the other, what the other tantras are capable of, of accomplishing, rather than just repeating uh, statements that may have been made about the other tantras. And is yeah. that, um, in that, do you actually, I mean, if you were to follow that and become, get rid of all obstructions to omissions and become a Buddha, what happens? Do you become actually a, a formed Buddha? Or do you wait for a new eon to appear? No, you did. Uh, when it is said that there's only one uh, emanation body in each era, that means that's called a supreme uh, chokitru, a supreme emanation body. And that means somebody who openly comes and displays the 12 deeds of a Buddha, uh, a special kind of birth and education and this and that, you know, makes a show of it. And otherwise, there can be hundreds and hundreds oh. of thousands of people who attain Buddhahood. That's good. Yeah, it is, isn't it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes. Um, do the four, the four different sections that you have, like the community formation, the body, and destruction, does that come together to form one aeon? One uh, great aeon. And these are, are 80 intermediate aeons. And so it's a cycle. And so when our world system dumps out in destruction and then goes in, in destruction, we'll all have to, unless we've attained, you know, release from cyclic existence before this, we'll have to take uh, rebirth in some other world system. But since there's an endless number of world systems, that's no problem. Yes? What is this supreme emanation come from? The supreme emanation body, for instance, Shakyamuni Buddha, um, it is said in great vehicle systems, was a, achieved enlightenment aeons and aeons ago and chose to, and I don't, I, I'm, I guess I can't answer your question well. But somehow, he was the one to uh, pretend to take birth as Gautama in, in, in India and to put on this display of attaining enlightenment in our world system. Out of this, in the Lotus Sutra, for instance, uh, because it speaks of Shakyamuni of having attained enlightenment in such a far distant past, they start speaking about permanent Buddhas, as if Shakyamuni was always a Buddha. Mm -hmm. And actually, I think it's a misreading of the Lotus Sutra itself, these uh, traditions that start talking this way. I think, uh, from my reading of the, of the Lotus, uh, it's, a, it's a misreading. But then, 
you know, what's so interesting is that you have this moving story of what happened to Gautama in India. And then they undercut it by saying, in a sense, right? By saying, well, this is just a display. It's sort of as if they, someone, I started feeling well, at some point, they must have felt the pressure of other systems where, you know, their deities were, you know, long-term deities. So they had to make it up that he was long-term. Because you would think that then they would make up a story about how so many zillion aeons ago in a country called Google, you know, Chakimuni was born as, you know, the farmer so-and-so. You know, they tell you the story, the earlier story, and, and sort of rev up your motivation. But they don't. And so similarly, the Maitreya, who is going to uh, appear in the next, uh, in the future, is not the Bodhisattva Maitreya. A lot of people say Bodhisattva Maitreya, but it's the Buddha Maitreya. There's Bodhisattva Maitreya and Buddha Maitreya. <laughs> so it's a convenient uh, distinction. Mm. How did we get off on all this? More? Well, I imagine maybe we can yes. get off for one more minute. Um, in the in the book, you in your book, you keep on talking about how um, the tantrayana is you have to bring into consciousness one moment of consciousness, both the truth body and the form body, kind of through the practice of deity yoga. What about the third, the, the bliss body? Is that well, um, you can take the three bodies of a Buddha, truth body, uh, great um, body of what we complete enjoyment body, and emanation body, and make them into two: truth body and form body, because the latter two have form. That's what's being done. Okay. Now, what is a uh, complete enjoyment body, it's a form body of a Buddha that appears only to bodhisattvas who have directly realized emptiness. So from the first ground on up, appears in special lands. Okay. In emanation bodies, um, so there, there are pure lands that are inhabited by complete enjoyment bodies and other pure lands that are inhabited by emanation bodies where even common beings can go. And then among emanation bodies, there are all sorts of interesting ones of uh, uh, Buddhas appearing as artisans and musicians. I used to think that Elvis was that <laughs> one of these, you know, <laughs> performer emanation bodies. You know, and you'd screw up, you know. You'd, you'd screw up just to show people that it wasn't that important. There used to be a guy at a bar in Bristol, Rhode Island, that we used to call Digger. He's a clam digger. And he's a mess. And he's a <laughs> You know, we're teenagers, you know, drinking away, and you'd look over there and dig over and go, and every now and then it would cross through my mind, am I going to end up like that? So I always figured Digger must be a, an emanation body. <laughs> so in other words, emanation bodies don't always look nice. Mm. And emanation bodies can be bridges also, things like bridges. Wow. Material bridges. Yes. It can seem to be material. But you could drive a truck over. Right. So the toll booth is uh, <laughs> it's a donation, right? <laughs> All for the sake of donation. So um, three topics to the course, which makes it somewhat difficult to think about the paper. And the paper has, wasn't it, a, isn't it a minimum length of 20 pages? 
and a maximum length of 40. It's not that I'm asking for 40. It's just that sometimes people get particularly garrulous and put everything down that they can think of, and it becomes almost unbearable. <laughs> uh, you know, I used to get a couple of 80 page papers, and, and you could tell the person couldn't fit it into 80 pages, also. <laughs> so, and especially when I'm asking you to demonstrate through your topic, or one of the things to do through your topic is, I don't want to make this come out the wrong way, is to demonstrate, um, what do I call it? Facility with the material, familiarity with the material of the course. Uh, you yeah, know, the top, these topics. In action tantra, the difference between sutra and tantra and the four and there was between the four tantras. So, you know, as soon as I say that, in one sense, you may think, oh my God, i got to cover everything. Well, there's no way you can cover everything, right? Uh, and, and it becomes then a catch-22, and you think, well, if I don't talk about this, it'll be you know? Now, what, what's really needed is a theme, development of some sort of theme. That's your theme, to organize the material around to organize your own thoughts, to use a, much as maybe one thing you might do, much as I have used uh, Hans, Kung, and Jung, you may want to use some grid that will help to show what's going on here. Something, you mentioned a topic like that, right? Uh, you don't necessarily have to. You may want to talk about light and dark. You want to talk about sound. I don't know. So with people who have had seminars before with me, do you have some words of technique to get around the ambiguities? So if you would write up for me a paragraph or two about what you're going to write on, that might be helpful. Some people have said, well, it would be helpful to do something, you know, to have not have just one thing at the end on which you either live or die uh, in terms of grades, um, but have something intermediate. It's hard to know what would be intermediate. I'm thinking, you know, we've had this chart. Uh, the next chart's going to be to chart out Songoba's uh, explanation of the difference between the sutra systems and then the uh, sutra and tantra, okay? So questions about the paper? When, when would you like to uh, give me the description the outline, outline, what do you say? Description, outline, whatever it is of your paper? In a week? Two. Two weeks. Is that too late? It gets late, doesn't it? It gets late very fast well, how at this point. Well, I'll get it back to you within a month. <laughs> <laughs> Due date of the paper should be when? Huh? Late. <laughs> Last day of classes? Everything gets put off to then, right? When's the final scheduled for? There is no final. Right. Maybe if we do the day that it's scheduled for. Oh, no. Then there's no opportunity to read it. When's the last day of classes? December 8th? Yes, yeah, I'm like, it's fairly late. Everything gets pushed to the end, then. but also I don't know what else you do. Next to last class? Uh, last class. Whenever it's due, you put it to the end. I mean, if it's due the first thing, Sunday. Mm. You do. <laughs> I'm a journalist. I work on deadlines. <laughs> so what else do you want to talk about with regard to the paper? Type it. Double space it. 
um, included, you know, standard bibliography, do the notes properly. So is it that we're picking one topic of the three topics of the course or doing all three topics of the course? That's your problem. <laughs> That's what I was mentioning is sort of the problem. I see. You know, and if there's some way you can peripherally sort of dip into the other two topics, that's neat. That's really neat. Don't forget diacritics. Diacritics. Um, these diacritical marks. Uh, do I need to make a difference between graduate students and non-graduate students? I guess I will. Non-graduate students don't need to do them. Graduate students must do them. Diacritical marks, these long, long marks. In Sanskrit, they're over the vowels. In Tibetan, they're over the consonants. So we need the actual ones for the consonants? Obviously, this is, is that that's a font. That's hard. You don't have the font. I have the font for the vowels for Sanskrit, but yeah. I don't have the font for the uh, yeah, add them in when it's over okay. to the Tibetan too. You need to learn my system, whether you use it or not. Okay. Later on, you I'll, won't. I'll make a <laughs> <laughs> Is there a particular form I want notes and I'm not really familiar with? Will that be evident? Chicago Manual of Style or whatever, any a, a specific manual, okay. but make it some manual that you can point. That consistent style. Yes, that you can prove to me is, is proper, OK? Because I'll, I'll say this isn't. And you say, ah, oh, then look at this. What's this? <laughs> Turabian. Turabian is one. Uh, author date versus, what? Author date versus um, full citation, either one. I can just put hot things like to mention. I prefer full citation myself. This author data just means you have to go look somewhere else. Yes? So uh, can we decide exactly when this little brief description of the topic will be doing? Yes. Um, when would you like it to be due? Uh, the the uh, 26th. Okay? That's Thursday, a week from this Thursday. Ben? You're open to another Western brand? Absolutely. Well, that's, okay, that's an interesting question. If you're going to go with the grid strategy, you, in the past you've asked for uh, spectrum of other Western authors on the topic? Oh, yes. Is it possible to use one or two in more depth to contrast as opposed to doing the spectrum? Yeah, what I've always said in the past, this came from Dan Vaya, who left this university many years ago. He used to ask his classes to make 10 citations of other works in the, in the body of the text. In other words, 10 comparisons at some point. They don't have to be long, you know, just something. You see, it gets you out to 10 works. It's like this thing of touching 10. Um, and you could, like, do two more seriously and do the other eight, you know. Similarly, uh, Blockenhaus says, Tantra is for the birds. <laughs> you know? <laughs> That's. One. <laughs> really, it's very mechanical. You know, it's uh, Mickey Mouse in one way, and another way it isn't. Okay, so that's the question of do these 10 people, do they directly have to be talking about Tibetan Tantra? Or no, not? Tantra. Okay, they do, it, it does have Buddhist. to be. Well, Tantra. Well, I don't know. What are you thinking of? I mean, <laughs> but it doesn't necessarily. Oh, oh yeah, from your grids. Sure, from your grids. That's all right. If you're going to find 10 Westerners talking about the country, if I'm using that grid, then. Yeah, but, but I do want you to look out at 
at, uh, you know, if you're doing some sort of ethical slant, you'll get uh, Eliades, perhaps, saying uh, Tantric Buddhism, Tantrism in India or whatever is totally non-ethical or whatever. What do you mean by a a, uh, a way of organizing material that will help to reveal something within it? For instance, Jung's theory about autonomous complexes. And you take that, those glasses, grid, as opposed to grid, say, glasses, and look at the material through those glasses, and it causes certain things to stand out. You take Hans Kung's theory of paradigm change, I did, and it helped me to see something about my own relationship to uh, practice of sutra, practice of tantra. If you want to use a uh, that somebody's approach that will help you, you know, that as you've been reading this material, you've oh wow, uh, so and so's theories about this and that are particularly helpful uh, for you know organizing this material or revealing what's going on. Okay. If you want. Would it be allowed to focus on, if you, if you wanted to focus, say, on the open thing, you looked at it simply in comparison to what he was saying about it, I mean, you're not going to come up, what was the point of coming up with nine other authors and their ideas of um, tantric techniques when the whole point of the paper might be just to, to utilize what Jung has to say or some other one, one or two particular authors have to say. Would that actually be the case? It might be the case. I mean, just supposing for your paper you want to concentrate on one or two particular. I followed what you said. Um, I would think that from the vast list of material that's over there, you could you could dig out such things. But I may be wrong. Uh, and I want to leave you the possibility of not doing it my way. But I want to ask you to look for it the other way. And say, you can put a little note on the front to me, okay? Telling me which way you chose to do it. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you tell us what you have to do, but don't count. <laughs> no, that's, that's, you know, I enjoy the Mickey Mouse thing. I, as I'm reading, I go like this. One of those rosary beads for me. It seems to be two different things going on. One is to take somebody who's not necessarily writing on Tantra and use their model of something else to illuminate the material. And the other thing is to look at the fine points of other scholars' writings on Tantra. So yes. Like two tasks. Yes, and I think the two do get blended, and I think you should be blending those two. That in the process of showing your your facility, your command of the material, unlike Hodge, Hodge, Hopkins depiction, Hodgkin's <laughs> depiction of deity yoga as a bacchanalic, you know. <laughs> so the, there are books on reserve already. And um, Don Lopez wrote an MA thesis. It's one of the things on reserve. You look under Lopez in this bibliography, which he, in which he a bit I mean, he himself, he says he's a bit embarrassed by his MA thesis now. Um, it's called The Difference Between the Buddhist Vehicles, Hinayana, Mahayana, and Vajrayana Master's Thesis, 1977. He went in and looked at a bunch of other authors and what they thought about Tantra. And what he's embarrassed about is 
he sort of beat them up because they didn't agree with Tsongkhapa. Now, I'm not asking anybody to beat them up because they don't agree with Tsongkhapa. I just want you to notice that they're different, OK? Notice where they're the same. Notice where they're different. We're not trying you know, to decide one's right, one's wrong. It's probably a little of each. Then, uh, for the next time, Were you able to read all of Pudun without your eyes glazing over? No. Some people actually you were right. I was much if you get enlightened, Pudun and then Pudun and enlightened. Sometimes the quotes don't seem to change. Seems like they're coming out of nowhere. I don't understand how it just backed up this thing in the end. Yes, it's always the fascinating thing with these writers to figure out. Why they what? quote what they quote. Because <laughs> <Okay. laughs> they don't give any, yeah. No. Yeah. So everybody made some attempt, right, to read Pudun? Some attempt? <laughs> uh, now, uh, has everyone begun to read Tsongkhapa or not? Some people have, some not. So for next time, read uh, Tsongkhapa's presentation. We'll, we'll skip Longchenba. Uh, just in, this will help to set the scene more to read Longchenba by reading Tsongkhapa. Because it, it's, what it is a, is a critical argument, as opposed to citation of a whole bunch of sources. It's really a dramatic shift in the, in the cultural environment to step in and say, hey, let's look at what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. Uh, and that's pages 136 to 159. And that's really a mouthful in itself. Uh, and then what we'll be reading, need to, is that, that's a distillation of Tantra in Tibet, that 136 to 159 is the distillation of this book. So you should, you know, as you can, begin reading it. And over our, the assignments through next week will include reading all of Tantra in Tibet. Now, at the end of Tantra in Tibet, I have a short section. a few chapters. The last chapter is quintessential points on the difference between Hinayana and Mahayana and the two Mahayanas. And it's just a few pages. And it is 31 quintessential points. Now, this book, The Tantric Distinction, <laughs> this guy is a coal miner from Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Where the hell did you get that picture? At least he took his hat off. What? At least he took his hat off. Oh, yeah. Then, in here, yes. Fine. 81, pages 81, to the end of the book, which is 164, is a re-rendition of those few pages at the end of Tantra in Tibet. In other words, you have these 31 quintessential points. And what this text tries to do in a readable way is to present that same material in 80 pages instead of four pages, 80 pages. And then what I'm doing in this material that you're reading for next time, these 30 or so pages, what is it? Whatever. Is distilling that. So by the end of next week, all of Tantra in Tibet, the last half of Tantric Distinction, and of course for this next time, Tsongkhapa's argument. Okay.
Why do you have uh, no one from the party lineage in here? I mean, you have Long Jeff on. I just wonder. It's why. because the person I looked into was uh, Bamar Gobble. Bamar Gobble, uh, great scholar, reaffirms the tradition and scolds Songaba for being innovative, really. <laughs> Uh, that's wording it euphemistically, I guess, for discarding tradition. And so his text, his text merely repeats what others have already said. So I'm looking for one that's interesting. That part where he dumps on Tsongaba is very interesting. But aside from that, I, I find it to be boring. Just because you've already, you, your eyes have already glazed over with Houdin and somewhat with long timber. So if you find one, tell me. 